Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Um, it's great to see such a big turnout today. And I, I'd like to say thanks very much to all of you for spending some time with us uh, this afternoon. So what I'm going to talk about um, just very briefly um, is an overview of some of the global trends that have been in the orphan drug space and rare disease space. Um, really just looking at some of the major opportunities, um, some of the threats, some of the regulatory developments that they've been and also um, on the R&D side. Um, just looking at a quick case study and then looking forwards to some of the schemes that are emerging in Asia and also um, globally what some of the major trends will be um, in the orphan drug space. So um, we've already had the introductions but just very briefly um, I'm based here in Tokyo covering the Asia Pacific region um, we have a team of people um, on the ground across the Asia Pacific and um, I've been here for about 20 years or so covering the pharma industry really covering all aspects ranging from commercial to policy and regulatory. And at the moment, um, my position is um, editor-in-chief of the APAC Insights, which includes Scrip and Pink Sheet, which hopefully some of you here today will be familiar with. So just to start off, um, this is a brief snapshot of how we expect to see pharma developing out to 2025. The peer set for this group is basically the top um, 16 big pharma companies globally. And so we're looking at how they may develop, what some of the major trends will be over the next, um, what, uh, eight years, something like that. Um, so some of the major trends that we see over the last few years, we've seen gradually um, stagnant revenues. We've had a lot of big patent expiries over the last few years. And then, of course, coming up over the next few years, we've got the biosimilars that are coming through. Um, some of the big branded biologics which are going to lose their um, patent and exclu exclusivity and um, that will have a fairly big impact on the global revenues of the pharma industry. But on the other hand, we've seen um, various new developments on the R&D side. Um, as you know, there's a lot of spending, a lot of activity still going on in R&D and we expect um, Big Pharma, that's the group of 16 that we, I mentioned before, uh, will add about, well, almost $18 billion worth or so in sales um, up to the 2020 period, which was similar to the amount that they added um, between 2010 and 2015. So fairly constant growth there for the overall um, group of 16 companies, big pharma companies. Looking a bit further out to 2025, we see big pharma adding about $39 billion in revenues out to that period, um, and the total... Uh, amount of combined prescription sales in the industry we see rising to about 464 billion dollars that's on a global basis but if we look at things on a regional basis um, it's a very mixed bag um, I think as many of you know here today Japan the outlook is, outlook is not particularly bright um, we're expecting for the prescription sector probably about l less than one percent or so growth out to 2025. Um, again, that's going to be impacted by a number of factors. Um, we've got some um, biosimilars coming through for big biologic products. And then also, um, we're seeing the gradual increase of uh, generic penetration in the Japanese market, which has obviously been helped by a number of uh, positive uh, policy changes over the past few years for the generic industry. So it's going to be growth, but it's not going to be very big in Japan um, in terms of the prescription sector. Um, globally, it's a fairly similar sort of picture. Um, the US is probably going to be the strongest growing region out to 2025. We expect close to about 2% or so uh, growth in the US. Um, but there is going to be some shift in terms of the corporate profiles. Who are the leaders going to be? It's probably going to be some changes there. We've seen very fast growth for companies like Gilead over the last few years. Um, obviously on the back of their big selling hepatitis C products. Um, those probably, the sales of those are going to be declining somewhat over the next few years. So we might see some changes at the top in the US and we expect companies like Roche and, and J&J um, to move, move into some of the top positions um, in the US. EU, again, fairly sort of um, moderate growth picture, probably less than, uh, than 1%. Um, again, uh, the... Biologics are going to have a big influence there, biosimilars and uh, competition for some of the big selling um, biologic products. 
So just continuing a, a general broad overview of the Big Pharma Outlook to, to uh, 2025, um, as I mentioned, we see the sector growing to about 464 billion um, by that period. And in terms of the overall global ranking, uh, within the group of 16 companies that I mentioned, we see Pfizer holding on to its top spot, um, although obviously the product mixes are going to change somewhat as the R&D pipelines come through and new products are launched. And there is going to be a shift um, very much away from infectious diseases, which has been um, probably one of the top categories over the past few years, much more towards oncology. So the big drivers there are obviously the development of the targeted drugs um, in oncology and more recently, of course, uh, the immuno-oncology space as well, where there's so much activity going on at the moment um, in terms of R&D and clinical trials. So that will really start to come through over the next few years as these new products are launched. Um, in terms of the top product, um, probably Humira will continue to be the top globally, but again, we're going to see some patent expiries um, over the next few years in the major markets. And I think Humira's sales are, are going to peak this year roughly, I think, $16 billion or so. Um, but we see those falling to probably about $11 billion by 2025. So, you know, it's quite a big fall in those overall figures, um, again, hit by biosimilar competition, mainly in the big markets. But on the positive side, um, the big pharma group that I've talked about, the 16 companies, they should add about $134 billion um, in revenues from their launch port portfolios, which are now being developed and are coming through R&D. So I think many of you will be familiar, those of you working in um, pharma companies on the R&D side will be very familiar with all these um, statistics. Um, basically, the message here is that it's taking a long time to develop new products. Um, we're talking almost 11 years from synthesis uh, to approval. So it's more than a decade. Uh, the lead times are very long. And we're talking several billion dollars also to develop new innovative drugs. Um, but on the other hand, you've got a very low likelihood of approval, um, at least at the phase one stage. That obviously increases as you move through development of phase two, phase three. But we're talking less than 10% in the US, um, the likelihood of approval at the phase one stage. So very high risk business, um, some major investments here, major time taken to develop new drugs. So the message here is very much um, uh, that Big Pharma is facing a lot of challenges in terms of its development uh, pipeline. We've seen quite a lot of changes over the last few years in terms of the biopharma pipeline. Um, that's growing very quickly. Again, that reflects all the activity that's going on in the biologics space. And that has translated actually in the US at least um, a couple of years ago in 2015 to a record number of approvals which was heading towards the um, 60 mark. And you can see from the, the two colors there, um, the light blue um, essentially is the biologics products. And um, you can see the share of those products in the overall approvals is actually increasing. But then last year, we saw quite a dip um, in the number of approvals in the US. So again, this is indicative of really the challenges that Big Pharma is facing in terms of the productivity of its R&D. So those slides are really just intended to set some of the scene for what's happening in Big Pharma, um, some of the challenges in R&D. And I think against that background, what we've seen over the last few years is much more of a shift towards personalized medicine. And I think we've seen this particularly in the oncology space, again, with the development of the targeted therapies that there has been over the last few years, and the shift towards immuno-oncology, which again is very much um, targeted basis. And I think a lot of this obviously is coming from increased um, knowledge that there is in terms of genetic links to disease, um, specific profiles of patients, specific gene mutations, how are those linked to disease, and then obviously developing therapies that, um, that target those particular patients. And I think you can see at the top left there in terms of the number of the personalized medicines that you can really consider to be targeted therapies um, for specific patient groups, how the activity has really increased there over the last few years, um, about 70% or so, um, the 2015 to uh, 2020 period, we see the increase um, in that particular sector. And we're already seeing in terms of the number of um, NMEs approved in the US, um, about, well, more than a quarter of those approved last year were actually 
could be considered personalized medicine. So this is something that's, that's really coming through already, um, through to the market and through to patients. And again, um, we can see very much activity on, in the oncology space. About half of those personalized medicines um, were, were in the cancer space. So again, very much about targeting specific patient groups. So in terms of some of the particular advantages of personalized medicine, I think um, one of them, I was actually really surprised at this figure. In the US, you're talking about $5 billion worth of drugs every year is essentially wasted. And I think that's due to various factors, um, including patients not adhering or complying to their courses, but also a big factor is that the products don't necessarily work for particular patient groups. So they may discontinue um, treatment, and this results in really massive wastage every year. And when you think of the cost to the healthcare system of all those wasted medicines, you can see that some of the benefits of the personalized um, approach. And I think for the companies also who are developing the new medicines, um, if you're targeting specific patient groups, you can pretty much guarantee quite high efficacy in those groups. So you can see the graph there on the top right. Um, using biomarkers in development generally results in much higher probability of approval than products without biomarkers. So again, targeting specific patients, getting those um, responses from, from your targeted products. And also, the fact, again, this was another fact I was very surprised at, um, targeted drugs that are actually used with companion diagnostics um, stand a much greater chance of getting approval than those that are not because of their targeted um, nature and the fact that they're working very well in specific patient groups. So I think having looked at all that, we can see that there are multiple factors driving big pharma's interest in rare diseases. And I think, again, it comes back to the increased genetic understanding of diseases that we've had. Um, again, on oncology is very much the dominant space here. And so we've seen a lot of interest by big pharma over the last few years in targeting specific smaller populations of patients for personalized medicines. Um, again, you can show that high efficacy and that, that in turn will help further down the road in terms of reimbursement and um, getting those um, patients and uh, actually developing new products that are effective in those patient groups. And then there's obviously a high medical need. Uh, we've seen certain sub-patient groups, again, in oncology. They haven't had very effective products available um, over the past few years or decades. So the new targeted products um, can be generally have very high efficacy rates and meet those high medical needs in some very serious diseases. And I think as far as the pharma industry is concerned, um, some of the advantages are that generally you need only f lower n um, numbers of patients for pivotal trials. And often, I'll talk about uh, a bit later that we've seen some case studies um, in the orphan disease space. But sometimes, even on the basis of fairly small phase two trials with a very low number of patients, you can actually, if you can show sufficient uh, efficacy, you can actually run smaller trials and actually get those products through the regulatory system. And that, in turn, means that the, the R&D costs for the developing companies tend to be um, lower. And then in the orphan drug disease space, we've seen um, generally on the regulatory side very favorable pathways. Again, I'll look at some specific cases in Asia later. But in a lot of the developed markets, um, we've got very clear pathways, very well-established um, pathways for orphan drugs, including here in Japan. Um, and the, they tend to be really quite favorable for those sort of targeted products for small patient groups. So you'll typically get support, um, you'll get longer periods of exclusivity, you'll receive more um, consultations and support from the regulatory body to actually get your product through the approval system. And the US, I think, was really one of the main first markets that um, came up with a, a proper system of um, orphan drug incentives. One of the main things there has been what's called a priority review voucher. And this is something that you can get um, actually from the FDA if you're developing an orphan drug. And it's something that can actually be traded with other companies. And I was actually su surprised to find that one of them, I think it was um, Sarepta's um, case um, for Exxon this, they actually traded their PRV, and I think it was to, to Gilead, if I remember correctly, for about $125 million. So these PRVs are very valuable things that enable um, companies to, to get um, that treatment from the FDA as the companies are moving through, um, 
products moving through development. And I think one of the other factors that's been driving a lot of big pharma interest in um, orphan diseases has been um, some of the um, indiv individual markets are generally fairly small, but when you add them together, they actually are really quite a sizable opportunity. So if you look globally on the number of uh, rare disease patients or orphan diseases, you're talking, I think, about 330 million patients or so. And again, uh, we're talking about 7,000 diseases, uh, many of which don't really have particularly effective treatments at the moment. So although the individual indications and drugs may be uh, quite small markets, when you put them together, you're talking really quite a sizable opportunity um, for the industry. And we've also seen big pharma making some moves, um, acquisitions of smaller companies specializing in the orphan drug disease space. And that it's um, really several reasons that are driving that. Um, the big pharma company can get access to a specialist sales force. Uh, for example, if they're developing a drug in a similar space, you get a ready-made expertise and ready-made development team in the same space that you're working in. So it's a quick way that you can build up um, expertise in that area. And I think one of the um, other main factors, again, we've seen um, driving big pharma interest in the orphan disease space is that generally end prices tend to be fairly high. So because of the lim limited number of patients and the fact that um, some of these drugs are showing very high efficacy um, will usually um, result in fairly high prices being offered by um, reimbursement bodies. So given all those attractive factors, it's maybe not surprising to see that orphan drugs um, are really, the field is really being dominated by big pharma. And um, if you look at the top companies actually active in the field, um, Sanofi is uh, the top one. That was obviously driven a lot by its acquisition of uh, Genzyme, which was very active in the orphan drug disease spaces. And they're developing close to 100 uh, products in the, in the space at the moment and then followed very closely by some other big pharma uh, companies, uh, very familiar names, GSK and Novartis as well, uh, both developing over 90 drugs um, in the orphan uh, drug disease space. So a lot of activity going on, um, very, very active R&D. And I think it's indicative of the number of opportunities that are left in the space. Um, the fact that you've got about 7,000 diseases, but so far there's only been about 232 uh, indications which have actually been developed and for which drugs have been launched. So there's an awful lot of opportunity there and there's an awful lot of um, medical need that's outstanding in the space for companies to, um, to develop new drugs. So we've generally seen an increase in the number of products that have been developed over the past few years. Um, there's obviously some up and down in the trend, but generally the, the numbers have been going up. So we're now talking um, 300 to 400 uh, approvals and a number of drugs which are actually uh, developed in those major markets um, that are outlined there. And I think because of the, the regulatory incentives that are available, um, the accelerated approval schemes, priority review, um, companies have been taking advantage of these. And if you look at the orphan drugs that are approved in the US um, in 2016, you'll see that um, a lot of these special treatments by the regulators have actually applied to those products. So virtually all of them received priority review, again, because of the high patient need that there is in those sectors. And many of them also received accelerated approval as well. And um, about 22 uh, medications approved by the FDA last year, um, about 41% of those were in the orphan space. So again, this, you're talking almost half of the new products approved in the US um, last year. Uh, we're all from drugs. So again, it's very sh uh, shows how much activity is going on and um, how many companies are now active in this particular area. And looking back in the pipeline in terms of the clinical development stage, um, phase one to three, we're talking about 4,500 drugs um, in active develop development at the moment. So again, a lot of uh, activity going on driven by those factors that I, uh, that I mentioned earlier. And I think the other big factor here driving the development is that um, about half of those affected by rare diseases are pediatric patients. So again, there's a very high outstanding medical need in that particular area um, driving this uh, research activity. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes um, looking at one particular case um, here in the US. Um, this was a drug, I think many of you will know this, uh, Mexondis 51 
developed by Sarepta for uh, Duchenne uh, muscular dystrophy. This was approved in September last year in the US, um, but it was really quite controversial, and uh, I think it illustrated a lot of the factors around the orphan drug development space. Um, the study that was done to support the approval was basically a phase one type of uh, study, study, phase two, with only about 12 patients. And they also used some interim data from a small phase three study. And there was a lot of debates about over the, over the results and whether they su sufficiently established the um, efficacy of the product and whether it showed that it was really effective in the target population. But the director of the CDR at the time, who was Janet Woodcock, um, she actually stepped into the process and made a decision to essentially approve the product over the objections of some of the reviewers within the FDA. So she made a value judgment, and um, her argument was basically that she wanted to provide maximum flexibility within the regulatory system, but still re retaining adherence to the statutory framework of the FDA, which is essentially to um, ensure safety and efficacy of new drugs. Um, but it was a very controversial decision. Um, there's obviously a great need in that particular area, in the DMD area, but there were some concerns expressed at the time about, you know, was this whole process essentially lowering the bar for the uh, de future development of orphan drugs and you know, would, um, in the future, would the FDA actually accept perhaps fewer amounts of data than it has done in the past? So it's, um, I think the debate is still going on. There's no real clear answers to that at the moment. Um, but there is a phase three study, actually, that's ongoing um, for Exxon this, but that is not due to report until 2021. So, again, the other question here is whether once those results have actually come out and are available, and what do they show? If they show that the drug is perhaps not as effective as it was expected, then what is the regulatory situation going to be? Um, might the FDA have to go back on its decision or how are they going to handle that? Um, so there's a lot of questions that have been raised by this um, approval of this particular product in the US. And I think it's very indicative of some of the major issues surrounding the orphan drug sector at the moment, um, both in terms of medical need how do you actually look at um, efficacy in a very small population and how do you make um, value judgments on that? So I think um, the following speaker from AMED is actually going to talk about this system in some detail. But I just wanted to touch on this as a very, um, to me it's a very interesting system in Japan, a network that's being set up to essentially bring together a lot of genetic data from across the country from various sources um, on rare diseases and trying to link that to um, particular disorders in certain patients and also potentially to actually use that information to develop new drugs in the future. So, um, for example, if there's um, a, a rare disease or undiagnosed disease, um, do patients suffering that from that particular disorder, for example, have a similar genetic profile to other patients with similar disorders? And if so, um, are there drugs that then could be developed using that sort of information? Um, so there are similar initiatives underway in some other countries as well, but I think this is something that's worth highlighting that's going on um, in Japan. Um, and I think, uh, as I said, the following speaker from AMED will, will talk a bit more about this initiative. So just in terms of what's going on in the rest of Asia, um, I think we've seen quite a lot of activity recently uh, Japan obviously has got a very well established orphan drug scheme. It's been um, set up for some time and I think companies are very familiar with that. The rules and the regulations and the requirements for the data are very clear. Um, but there has been some activity recently. Um, we've actually just seen, I think over the last week or so, um, India is actually looking at setting up a more formal orphan drug scheme. And they're now thinking about what are the criteria for that scheme? How are we going to set it up? How is it going to work? But then South Korea also has made several steps over the last um, few years to actually ease the designation and approval of orphan drugs. And the criteria are somewhat similar to Japan, although the numbers are a bit different. It's obviously a smaller country. And I think their threshold is about 20,000 people or so. In Japan, it's usually about 50,000 or so for orphan treatment. But otherwise, I think the scheme is fairly similar. Um, it offers um, extending uh, val validity of marketing approvals and also market exclusivity as well. Um, you get additional periods of that. 
um, because it's a smaller patient population that you're dealing with. And then review periods as well are generally expedited compared to normal drugs. So generally, um, quite similar scheme to Japan, there's greater flexibility around trial design and the evidence requirements as well. So we are seeing, I think, a number of countries um, in Asia considering orphan drug schemes and how they can actually support the development of uh, these sort of products for high-need patient populations. And I think the regulatory changes are actually resulting in quite positive developments. Um, we've seen in Korea that um, about almost close to 50 orphan drugs uh, were approved in 2015 versus only 28 in the previous year. So again, companies are being attracted by these regulatory um, incentives and um, I think in Korea another reason was that the government was looking to support the uh, development of the domestic market and the de development of new drugs by domestic companies as well. And we've already seen last year we had about 14 compounds newly designated as orphan drugs um, in Korea that year. So again, you know, regulatory requirements can have a really big impact on the activity by the industry um, in the orphan drug space. So to finish off, um, just a very quick overview of what the outlook is for the global um, orphan drug space. Um, it seems to be a, quite a complex mix of positive and negative factors. Um, we're seeing some moves, uh, as I mentioned, in Asia to develop formal orphan schemes, but also the EMA as well in Europe. Um, we're looking to actually re speed up the existing system that they have and try and reduce some of the lags that there are at the moment between um, the positive opinions for orphan drugs and actually getting them through to final approval and to market. So again, the whole idea is to speed up the process to get those products quickly to patients um, compared to the current system. Um, again, pricing I think generally is going to be um, quite a positive outlook. Uh, high prices are generally awarded to orphan drugs because of the very, s very small patient populations. There's a lot of debate obviously going on around that at the moment. Um, but if you look at the EU, for example, only about 5% of the total pharma budget in the EU is actually given to orphan drugs. So there's a lot of headspace there. There's a lot of room for expansion in terms of the funding of orphan drugs um, in the e EU. So potentially, that's a positive factor there. But I think on the negative side, um, again, we're seeing rising uh, scrutiny of drug costs generally. I mean, it's happened obviously in Japan last year with all the uh, immuno oncology debate that there was um, going on in Japan. We're seeing it in the US. I mean, President Trump has said quite clearly that uh, drug prices are going to be one of his focuses going forward. So again, a lot of uncertainty there. We're not really sure what's going to happen. And that might also follow on through to the orphan drug space as well. So I think there's going to be a lot of um, debate going on around the cost versus the benefit versus the need for innovation. Um, I think there's no easy answers. Uh, there's just going to be a lot of discussion around those areas, I think, over the next uh, few years. And I think as a result of that, we might need to see some sort of increased flexibility from the part of the industry, particularly for the orphan, um, ultra-orphan products for very, very small targeted populations, which have very high prices. You know, you're talking obviously um, several hundred thousand dollars in many cases. So. On the company side, there may need to be a bit more flexibility. And I think um, this is something where the companies, it's going to be critical for developers to actually work together very closely uh, with KOLs, with advocacy groups as well for patients for these diseases and insurance as well. And I think we've seen in the US that um, working very closely together with those groups can actually be very helpful in terms of understanding um, better the real benefits that, um, that some orphan drugs can actually bring. And I think, again, this is a process that's going on in the US, but we're going to see more discussion of actual criteria for orphan drugs as well. Um, you know, what's an appropriate patient number? Um, how should we be treating orphan drugs? Um, there's going to be a lot of discussion about that, and I think that's already started in the US. I think because of the some of the products have already gone through the regulatory system on the orphan side, um, and the questions that have been raised around those, there's going to be a lot more discussion going on um, in the next couple of years. So a very uh, whirlwind tour of the orphan drug um, sector, but I hope it's um, been useful for you. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.